Today we've got a great revenge story against someone who's adamant they don't need help speaking a foreign language. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, say hello. So I work in the fast food industry, and sometimes when I greet a customer with a nice smile and a polite hello, even though I'm tired and wish to just go to my bed and pass out but still have several hours till I'm done with my job, all I ask is for them to say hello back before they start to name their order. Instead they go, I'll have the, or you'll give me, not even a dang hello, or could I get a, I mean how hard is it to take a second to say hi or something. So now when someone does that, I either change the vibe I'm giving off to a duck you vibe, stay silent and don't even bother saying stuff, just say the price of their order without please or thank you, and end the whole thing without saying have a nice meal, just ignore them back as they say goodbye. I mean it's not much, but I hope they learn some ducking manners. From what I've experienced from most fast food places I go to nowadays, they try to actually correct this issue by making it so it's mandatory for those working the counter or the drive through to say something like, welcome to so-and-so, can I get you started with an X thing here? Something that they have to offer or say upon greeting somebody, not just a hello. That said, I feel like if you're working a fast food job and you're expecting to get pleasantries from the people ordering, you're already expecting too much. You should just be grateful that they're not flinging crap at you or yelling at you. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of revenge, it would be amazing if you left a like or left a review if you're listening to my podcast. That said, our next story is Game With Lights. This happened a few hours ago and I'm still laughing. It took place in Serbia, so some things may not make sense for the school setting you envision. Characters in the story, names changed, Bob and me. It was a regular class on the second floor and the sun was shining. Bob was adjusting the curtain realizing that if he moved it slightly to the left, the light would shine directly on me. He did just that, sitting next to the curtain so that if I stood up, he'd quickly pull it back into place. Irritated because I was wearing a sweatshirt, the one without a zipper, unable to take it off and feeling overheated, I asked him to close the curtain. Instead, he opened it even wider. None of us wanted to create enough drama for the teacher to notice as the teacher was conducting an exam during that class, so risking it wasn't worth it. That's when I noticed a ruler on the table, a glass ruler. I pointed the ruler, which naturally reflected light into his eyes, and positioned it to look like it was just leaning against my pencil case. Every time he moved, I adjusted it a bit. Ten minutes later, he closed the curtain. You gotta work with what you got. It's either the glass ruler or you risk going straight to the phone, trying to angle the phone perfectly. You know how you're sitting in the passenger seat of the car just using your phone and you realize you've been inadvertently flashing the glare into the driver's eyes? Yeah, sorry. Or, you know, they call you out on it. This next story is, I need a doctor's note to work from home? Guess I'm not working at all. A fairly short story that took place today. So for context, I'm working as an engineer and all my work is done on my work laptop. Because of this, teleworking is pretty much the way of working ever since the pandemic started. However, two weeks ago, we got a new manager who decided that we had to have a mandatory team day at the office once a week. Basically wanting everyone on the team to be present that day. I don't like the idea of mandatory presence at the office, but whatever I thought by myself. I usually go once a week to the office anyway for various reasons. Fast forward to today, it's our mandatory day and I'd been coughing since yesterday night, so I decided not to risk it and stay at home. I had the symptoms of some illness but felt like I could still work. Besides that, I don't want half the office to be sick as well by next week and blame me for it, so I sent my manager a mail to inform him that I wouldn't be present at the office. Not much later, I got a reply back stating that agreements must be respected and that mandatory days can't be missed without a doctor's note. So that's exactly what I did. I went to the doctor the same day, and she gave me three sick days off, took a picture of the doctor's note and sent it to HR with the manager in CC. I still don't understand why he made it such a big deal that I wanted to work from home for my own and my team's well-being, but hey, three days off. All I'm saying is, is I have a heaping appreciation for any doctor that sees a situation for what it is, and is willing to help somebody out with some ridiculous request like that. The kind of doctors that say, you know what, you better just take the rest of the week off. Our next story is, Invisible Girl Steals Pasta in the Grocery Store. Something I, 28 year old female, witnessed last night at the supermarket. I am way too much of a coward to do anything like this myself. I was in the condiment aisle picking out salad dressing. 
There was another girl, looked around my age, reading the back of mustard packages. I'm assuming to look at the ingredients. In comes another woman, 40-ish, on a scooter. I don't want to contribute to stereotypes, but this was a rather large person and very cliche of the particular large chain supermarket I was in. She stopped her cart for 20-ish seconds, probably 10 feet from Mustard Lady. I didn't think anything of it. Mustard Lady was barely 5 feet and maybe 100 pounds, standing close to the shelves. She had a basket close beside her that I think took up more space than her. Suddenly, Scooter charged forward, swerving a bit closer to the shelves, looking right at Mustard. Admittedly, I had chosen that moment to try to peek at Mustard Lady's basket. I'm chronically curious, so I caught the whole thing. With a yelp and rather impressive back jump, Mustard Lady dodged the Scooter, but her basket was toppled over, knocking several things out. Scooter Lady kept her head forward and made no acknowledgement. Before I could even decide if I had the social fortitude to offer to help, Mustard Lady scooped up her goods and basket, caught up with the scooter, and grabbed what looked like a box of pasta from the scooter's basket. She then walked across the aisle and made to put the pasta box on the top shelf where Scooter Lady couldn't reach. Scooter Lady screeched, what the heck? Mustard Lady responded with a deadpan, oh, so you can see me. I don't remember the exact phrasing because I get petrified of even secondhand conflict and it was so absurd, but Scooter Lady gave a short rant about Mustard Lady being in the way and needing to pay more attention to her surroundings. I think Scooter Lady thought Mustard Lady was on her phone, her large, yellow, French's brand phone. I don't think Mustard Lady actually intended on placing the pasta box up on the shelves because she had just been sort of holding it up. However, when Scooter Lady's self-righteous speak was over, Mustard Lady didn't say another word. From what I could see out of the corner of my eye, she didn't even look mad. Mustard Lady just looked right at Scooter Lady and tossed the box onto an upper shelf and walked away. Though she did walk the long way behind the scooter, I think to avoid being run over again, I had been pretending to choose between some vinaigrettes, but tossed the closest one in my cart and slipped quickly away, lest I become the next hit and run victim. Fortunately, the salad dressing was very close to the end of the aisle. I can only imagine that was a situation where Mustard Lady will think of and regret not having some sort of comeback, but that silent pasta toss was absolute gold. I didn't see either of them again, but the pasta box was still there when I walked past the aisle on my way out. Not the most interesting story, but in my very boring, social anxiety filled life, it was quite an event. Well, she certainly mustered the courage up to confront the scooter lady. No, I totally didn't steal that from a comment on the post. I'm absolutely creative enough to come up with that. I'm no impasta. Our next story is Revenge on My Five Year Old. My five-year-old is taken to sneaking up behind me and pinning a clothes peg on the back of my jumper. At first, it was a little harmless fun of pretending not to notice and making a game of discovering said peg shortly after. More recently, the little horror has turned into some sort of ninja, which means I invariably end up sitting down on my desk on a morning to find another peg digging into my lower back or having a stranger or work colleague tap me on the shoulder saying, Excuse me, but do you know about the peg? Enough is enough, so I've just spent about the last 10 minutes of my life systematically going through his drawers while he's out at school, pegging every t-shirt and sweater he owns. The joke's on you when the kid shows a lack of care and starts trying to actually go to school with the clothes peg on their clothes. Who will be the real one that gets revenge in the end in that circumstance? Our next story is, I filled my apartment with carnivorous plants despite my vegan roommate. Okay, so I, 24 year old female, have been living with my roommate, 26 year old female, for 3 years. My roommate is a strict vegan and has been since she was 14. I, however, am not. This has never been a problem, since I think people can do whatever they want with their lives, and I've never tried to change her mind about being vegan. My roommate is a bit of a plant lady. She's been collecting and raising different types of plants for years and has amassed quite a collection. She even puts little sticker labels with the names she's given them, which is adorable. She's truly one to die for her plants. I think this is cool, but have never really interacted with them besides watering them whenever she's out. It really doesn't get in the way of my life, so I don't care that she's so obsessed with them, and I'm glad she has a hobby. Here's where the problem begins. Two months ago, she visited a conference on animal products and came back with a more fiery spirit. She started going to events regularly, became a local activist, 
started preaching to people in the street, etc. Now, this isn't a problem. She's a human being who can believe whatever she wants. Or at least it wasn't a problem. Until every conversation with her transformed into telling me why I should go vegan, why I'm evil for consuming animal products, and how I should be ashamed that I'm not vegan. This seemed weird since she hadn't acted like this prior to the conference, but it had gotten so common, I started waking up earlier to go to work so I could eat my eggs in the parking lot of my job so I don't have to hear her rant. Since we were close to the end of our lease, I had decided to pull a little stunt before we parted ways. I headed to an exotic plants place near where I live and got a bunch of different types of carnivorous plants. I'm talking every single species I could get my hands on. I also got pots and things to hang them from so they looked pretty. My roommate wasn't there that day so I had plenty of time to set the place up. I decided to do it in the kitchen since that's where most of her scolding would take place. I put them everywhere I could. Wherever she had a plant, I put one right beside it. Just to be extra petty. It looked like a greenhouse in there. Honestly, I was pretty proud of my work. I felt like Buddy the Elf when he renovated the store. When she got home, she started screaming at me, blowing up saying that I'm horrible. She was livid, but because I bought them and I hadn't moved or touched anything of hers, she couldn't do anything. It's been like this for the last few weeks and I've been caring for them daily and even researching the best ways to keep them alive and purchasing products so they can thrive. Honestly, I've gotten pretty fond of the plants. I went as far as naming and labeling them. I'm moving out today, so I thought I would tell this story, because it's kinda crazy. So as long as none of those plants are an Audrey too, I think OP's totally good. I'm just imagining they walk in and every shelf in the place is adorned with a Venus flytrap. Our next story is, follow me to my house, I'll follow you back. Driving home yesterday and I needed to change lanes so I could make a right turn in a couple of blocks. I checked my mirror and hit my turn signal. Well, the guy that was back a couple car lengths speeds up and tries to block me in the left lane. Sorry, but I'm coming over. The guy lays on his horns for half a block. I laugh and wave. I even used all my fingers, not just the middle one. So the guy follows me for the next mile and turns into my neighborhood behind me. Not unusual, since there are some apartments there. He follows me for a couple more turns and I start paying attention. The last two he would only make if he lived on the same street. Still, I have a couple of neighbors that drive the same kind of car, so not too worried. When the guy drives past my house to the end of the block and turns the corner, I know he was just freaking with me. Well, crap! Now he knows where I live and what I drive. I know nothing other than it's a guy driving a Subaru. Narrows it way down, right? So I back out of my driveway and back around the corner. Sure enough, here he comes around the block and back out of the neighborhood. At this point, I decide to give the guy a taste of his own medicine and start following him. He jumps on the main road and heads north. I follow the guy for about 5 miles to the next town. He's driving okay and I'm keeping a safe distance, but on his tail enough that he knows I'm there. I had been watching him gesturing with his hands and swerving a little. Not bad though, so I figure he's talking on the phone. I'm hoping he doesn't have a bunch of friends waiting wherever he's headed, but he also has a temp tag and I still couldn't identify a thing other than the make of the car, so I keep going. He heads through a light and onto Main Street, and at that point, I know he's on the phone with 911. Perfect! Sure enough, the guy pulls up to the police station and into a parking space. I roll up right next to the guy and hop out to go talk. He won't even look at me, so I stick my phone camera in his windshield and take a picture of the dude. Just then, a cop walks up behind me and starts asking why I'm following the guy and videoing him. Two more cops show up and start asking me a bunch of questions too, so I explain that he followed me first. They go over all the things that could go wrong with me following someone, so I go over all of the things that could go wrong without me following him, and that I was glad he came to them, because now, even though I don't know who he is, they do, and he knows it. So now I don't have to worry about him coming by my house later. They were all telling me how shook up the guy was, that he was pretty scared. I told them to let him know that following people to their homes probably wasn't the best activity for him. They agreed. I mean, yeah, obviously it goes both ways here. OP probably should not have followed that guy back, but hey, they followed you all the way to your home, and you wanted to give it right back to them, if anything, to try to show that you're not scared, and to maybe hopefully run them off from trying to come back. 
Needless to say, if you're in a situation similar to OP and you have the slightest inkling that you might be getting followed, it's probably for the best to not drive home or, you know, take a bunch of extra turns and really make sure that you're genuinely being followed and then call the cops. I mean, I think this was a great way to deal with it through and through because now it's on the record. At least cops have witnessed it. Our next story is, that's not me. Really? Video shows otherwise. This happened almost 10 years ago. I was probably 19 years old. I was home alone when my neighbor rang my doorbell to tell me someone had hit my parked car. My neighbor and I went out to inspect my car and there were some light scratches and the paint was messed up. My concerned neighbor told me that the other driver should pay to fix it and if there was any trouble, I should call the police and she would be a witness. She told me she heard a loud noise outside, came out, and saw a man in a blue SUV pull away and move the car further down the street in front of another house. I thanked her and went back inside to see if anything was caught on the security cameras we have. The camera points at our driveway and into the street. Mom parks in the driveway, so I always parallel park my car right in front of our house. Sure enough, when I replay the last 30 minutes, a blue SUV pulls up behind my car, tries to parallel park, and hits my car in the process. He definitely realized he hit something because he comes out of the car, looks, gets back in, and then drives past my car down the street out of frame. This was a big tall man wearing a bright orange polo, very easily identifiable. I honestly didn't mind the scratches. To me, it was minor. If he had came to tell me about the accident instead of my neighbor, I probably would have been okay if he just apologized. My neighborhood is very small and I knew most of my neighbors. I had not recognized this man. I walked outside to where I saw the blue SUV, now parked in front of the house with a recently sold sign. Surely it wasn't. I walked up and rang the doorbell. He answered in his annoyingly bright orange polo and whitey tidies. Now, in hindsight, everything makes sense. But I was young, scared, and trying to hype myself up for the confrontation already. And this was just creepy and weird to me. Why would you think it was okay to answer the door like that? I asked if he was the owner of the blue SUV outside. Which one? Uh, that one? The only blue SUV outside? I explained to him about what my neighbor told me and security camera footage. He says, hold on, puts on his pants and tells me to show him the footage. So we walk towards my house. Again, I was very scared and nervous. Even if he was a new neighbor, I wasn't sure about inviting him inside the house and what his reaction would be, so I decided to record on my phone our interaction from him first entering my home. I replay the footage on our security monitor of his car hitting mine, him getting out with the same shirt at the end where he's driving away. We also see and notice a Star Wars sticker on the back of the SUV that matches what I saw on his actual car too. Anyway, it doesn't matter. He gets angry and says, that's not me. This was honestly not the response I was expecting at all. I laughed nervously like, what do you mean? I say your shirt is the same. He says, that could be anyone. It's your car, your sticker. You can't really see. But your shirt color when you get out. You can't prove that's me. Uh, Okay, so he just grumbles away, heads out my door and back to his house. At this point, I'm pretty mad too. Again, if he was apologetic, even if he had given me a sob story excuse, how he's having a rough time, made a bad decision, whatever, I would have just been like, don't worry about it. It's just scratches. It's an older car anyway. But you one, hit and run. Two, deny and lie when confronted with all this evidence? Like, no. So I listened to what my neighbor said earlier. Call the police if there's trouble. You want to be a weirdo? Now I'll be petty and make this bigger than it needs to be. Police are now here, talking to me, and my neighbor who heard and saw him. I explained I confronted him, showed him the footage, and his denial. I show the police the security footage, as well as the confrontation recorded on my phone, where a big guy in an orange shirt is pointing to another man in an orange shirt yelling, That's not me! The police also found this pretty amusing. I talked to the police and while my concerned neighbor was being fussy like, doesn't she need to get that repainted? The cop was like, these damages are so minor, not really, but I could call insurance to figure out the damage cost he'd pay if I wanted it repaired. I said no, cause it wasn't really significant. 
The last I saw him was talking with the police in front of his house. Later in the day, my concerned, nosy neighbor comes back to tell me he was arrested. She saw him, of course, getting put into handcuffs and put in the back of the car. Later that week, I was visited by a detective from the police department. He wanted to go over my statements again, as well as emailing him the video footage I had. He explained to me that he was arrested for DUI. Like I said, everything made sense then. Why did he park in front of my house first, then move his car near his house? I have no idea. I just thought he was a weirdo, but answering the door in his underwear, his glazed eyes, illogical, gibberish, arguing, repeating, that's not me, definitely drunk. I hadn't been around people who really drank like that, so I didn't know. He smelled, but I just thought it was B.O. Definitely not a good first impression, since the whole neighborhood was now talking about our new neighbor's drama, courtesy of Nosy Neighbor. They moved out about a year later. This whole story, I had only one thing on my mind. But you got me on the counter, saw me banging on the sofa. In all seriousness, I wonder if he moved out a year later, or if there was some kind of circumstance in which they couldn't afford it, or they got kicked out a year later. This next story is, kid laughed at me during lunch hour, so I removed his rewards. I, 18 year old male, work at a boba shop which tends to get very busy during lunch hours half the time. There's a reward system where every 10 drinks that you buy, you get one free drink. Well, on this very special day, crap got really busy as soon as the label machine broke down from a phone call that last minute placed around 180 drinks. I was using another machine, but it was very different from what I usually use. I would have people writing down their phone numbers, so that way me or my manager could add the rewards at the end of the day. There was this one kid and his sister who were about 6 to 9 years old who gave me a very hard time and laughing at me for what I was doing. He then asked me to put down his phone number, so I did that but then decided as a petty revenge for giving me a hard time during the busiest hour, I threw the paper with his phone number away in the trash so that I would not add his reward. I would do it still to this day every time I would see him. Can we just stop and rewind to somebody ordering 180 drinks? What um, kind of time frame was that in? Did they want that same day or did they want that two weeks from now because only one of those I feel is actually realistic. Our next story is, I don't need any help, I can speak French just fine. So as a family, after I did my GCSEs, the old high school leaving exams, and walked away with an A in my French class, my parents announced we were going to spend three weeks in a friend's cottage in Normandy. I realized very quickly that since my sister was taking Spanish, my brother failed French, my dad spoke no French and neither did my grandmother, I was going to be doing a lot of the heavy lifting on this trip. My mother assured me that she had decent French and wouldn't need my help. Sweet. The petty revenge began on the second day of the trip. We went to one of the nearby towns for my mother to find a bank and exchange some money. This was some years ago when this sort of thing was handled with paper notes. So my mother confidently asked for a check de travail. I giggle. The cashier giggles. We make eye contact. My mother gives me an irritated look. She gets her money. She stutters, merci, au revoir, and we leave. For three weeks, this experience was repeated every time we visited the bank. I had the time of my life. After our final visit, as we drove across Normandy for our ferry back to the UK, my mother finally asked what was so funny. I said, you do realize you've basically been asking for a work permit, right? My mom said, well, why didn't you tell me? I said, you told me over and over you didn't need my help. For the uninitiated, my mother had made a very common mistake. Travail is to work. The word she needed was voyage, to travel. If somebody wants to make a fool of themselves, it's easiest just to stand back and let them make a fool of themselves. Especially when you know there's no real damage to be done here, besides some people maybe laughing at them. And plus, I think that kind of thing can be some of the best learning experience you can get. Next time, they'll probably actually lean on you. Our next story is Extra Sick Day. I never call out from work unless I'm actually sick or have an emergency, as I feel bad for my department or co-workers if they're short. It can get really busy and instead of having temps available, we just suffer the day short-staffed. I usually get a cold once a year during flu season without fail. 
Management tends to play favorites, and the worst employees but best suck-ups would get away with calling out frequently with no repercussions or stipulations. One year, I finally got so annoyed that I was told to bring a doctor's note yet again, even when I'd been clearly showing signs of a cold at work the day prior to calling out sick. I went to urgent care, as usual, where I would wait two to three hours just to look and sound like crap for a doctor to witness, and I asked if the doc could please write me out for three days instead of just the one. If I had to spend half my day at urgent care to get a note, I'm not going to go back to work quickly. I used to get a note for just the day and return to work the next day, but since they started forcing me to get these doctor notes for the once a year I call out sick, I started being sick for more than a day since then. They can suffer the shortage for three days instead of one. Like, I get if it's going to be more than one day they would want a doctor's note, but if somebody's calling out sick for just a day, especially considering they haven't made a habit of it, yeah, it's ridiculous. Our next story is, disrespect me? Have fun waiting 21 days for your money? I do a lot of work with the homeless. My house is offered to many that I trust for a night when the weather is extreme. We've had a few days of snow lately and last night I got a call. I have two rules for staying at my house. One, no drugs. Two, respect me in my house or lose both. I have a couch with a pull-out bed that's always made and ready for whoever needs it. Because of my first rule, not many take me up on my offer. Last night I got a desperate call so I got on my car at 9pm and drove an hour to pick him up. He offered me gas money which was a huge help because I was on empty. When I picked him up, he told me he needed to get his backpack from a friend. That's common to leave things with others who have a car or shelter if you don't. An hour and a half later, his friend was talking too loud on the phone and I hear he's trying to get drugs, not his backpack. I told him that he knew my rules and he wasn't bringing drugs in my car or my house. So he freaks out on me, slams my car, starts crying that he's going to be out in the rain all night, saying I'm just like his abusive ex-girlfriend, even going as far as to call me a little Ashley. He had sent me gas money via an app, but because he put in his password incorrect four times, it held the funds for 24 hours. I left and he starts blowing up my phone demanding the money back. There was no money in my account because it was on a hold. He saw that email when it happened. He was sitting right next to me. So this morning he starts threatening me, saying he's going to claim fraud and ruin my account and my credit. Obviously he doesn't understand how this works because he can do neither. This morning I get an email saying he filed a claim stating that he didn't receive the item. He can only get his money back if the sale was done online, not just the payment. An in-person sale doesn't qualify for a refund, and it wasn't a sale. I don't want a black mark in my account, so I submitted our texts saying he was giving me gas money and the explanation. Now, instead of sending it back after the 24-hour hold, he has to wait up to 21 days until the claim is settled. Even then, it will go to my account. I'll send it back but I shouldn't because I still drove an hour to get him, waited an hour and a half, and he knew the rules before he even asked. Have fun waiting three weeks. I mean, OP had pretty clear rules. I think there's a lot of people out there that would hear, all you have to do is stay clean and respect me and my house and you can stay here temporarily, would be darn near working like a hired housemaid just to have shelter for a short while. Our next story is, we were only trying to help. This story takes place at least 20 years ago. It was the weekend before Thanksgiving and I was at the grocery store with my mom and sister. We make our way toward the baking supply aisles, a very busy section that time of year, when we see a half full shopping cart sitting abandoned by an end cap. We quickly figured out it was the lady talking to her friend and looking at pictures down the adjacent aisle and she had no intention of moving anytime soon. We decided to be helpful and moved her cart over a couple of aisles so it wouldn't be in everyone's way. Then we thought we would help her with her shopping and added the ingredients she would need to make a dessert to her cart. I don't remember what it was, but it was probably some kind of pie. After that, we left the cart and continued on our way. In the checkout line, we see her in the next lane getting visibly irritated by the random extra stuff she kept pulling out of her cart. We buried the items so she wouldn't notice right away. To this day, I can't be in the baking section of that store without chuckling to myself about it. I mean, you really have to be engrossed in something at the store to not notice your cart 
had been taken away from you. Especially considering these carts are not like stealth machines. Usually those wheels are not greased up and ready to just be quietly moved away. Even if you're in the adjacent aisle, you usually hear something like that being moved around. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.